can see us. Welcome, welcome to session zero of Burn Bright. Oh boy, I'm really, really excited to be here. I am surrounded by some awesome people. Um, But before I get into introducing everybody here, I guess I should start with what is this? What are we doing here? Uh, What is Burn Bright? What is is session zero? Uh, Well, you're going to be learning a lot about Burn Bright over the course of the night, um, but it is a science fantasy game set in the galaxy of Alaxis, which is ever shrinking due to some unexplained phenomena that is ever encroaching on life, the systems, the planets uh, that make up this galaxy. And everyone around you will be playing heroes, uh, sapient alien species uh, that populate this galaxy. Um, And tonight for session zero, we're going to be going over more of the story of the game and then also making our characters in preparation for next week when we officially start episode one of uh, of our campaign here. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, And let's go around the table and introduce our awesome players. So Darcy, let's start with you because you also have a very strong connection to Burn Bright. Um, So who are you? What do you do in the world of tabletop? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Darcy Ross. My pronouns are she, her. And uh, what I do in the world is I I love games and I play them. And I'm also a biologist by training. Uh, And so I got brought onto this awesome Burn Bright we in Bright Project um, very early on and uh, had a lot of fun thinking about this wonderful science fantasy world and kind of hopeful space exploration um, while also addressing sort of real world issues, but also through the lens of so much of my biology training. So I study weird creatures. And so there's a lot of like weird creature love in this game. And I hope you will all love it as much as I did. And uh, all the designers brought a lot of awesome, awesome, cool, weird you know, science inspired uh, world building to this game. And so it totally rocks. Uh, By day, I uh, am the community relations coordinator for Monty Cook Games. So I play games like Numenera, which is science fantasy and, you know, very, uh, very cool and lots of weird creatures as well. Invisible sun, surreal magic and fantasy. Um, And yeah, I do a little streaming here and there, a little other kind of design work. But um, I am absolutely like pleased as punch to be here as a player in your game and being a part of this campaign. So thank you all. Yay! <laughs> all right. And let's keep going around the circle here. Nassim, who are you? What do you do in the world of tabletop? Hi, I'm Nassim. Uh, in the world of tabletop, I am a regular cast member of the Venture Mains podcast, which I'm sure you know, Celeste DMs. And uh, outside of that, uh, my background is in performance, in theater and film and everything. And um, I'm excited for a fun space adventure. I have been craving it for some time. And I think that your phrasing was cute and adorable and perfect. I am also pleased as punch to be here. Oh, <laughs> punch. Uh, <laughs> and keep going around uh, clockwise. Uh, Jess, who are you? What do you do in the world of tabletop? Uh, hi, I am Jessica Ross. I, in the world of tabletop, I am an editor on D&D. Um, and I'm also uh, on the podcast D20 Dames. Uh, which is a family-friendly actual play podcast and I do lots of like writing and editing and all of that good stuff and I'm also very excited for Space Adventure. Yes and Eugenio who are you? Hi everybody I'm Eugenio uh you might know me as DM Jazzy Hands uh in the world of tabletop I am primarily the DM and producer of yet another actual play podcast The Last Refuge um and uh I also had the great honor of working with Celeste on the block party last weekend and have been in and about. Uh, My background is also in in theater and and the arts and we're all streaming games now because, well, our careers are super on hold. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yep. Uh, But I'm very excited to be here. Uh, You know, I I was talking to somebody earlier today and I was just saying like space RPGs have never really been my jam because I think I'm intimidated by Star Wars and Star Trek fandoms because I'm not super into, I just have never like really learned the deep lore of that stuff. It's a deep dive for sure. Yeah, and I I read the first page of like the introductory lore about this game and I was like, oh, I'm super into this. I'm here for this. Yes, Yes. let's go. Yeah. So this is my wonderful cast. Uh, My name is Celeste Conowich. I'm a freelance game designer in the world of tabletop, uh, the DM for Venture Maidens. Um, I do podcasts, streams, and all kinds of stuff. Um, I am so, so excited to be here playing this new, brand new game. Um, 
Burn Bright is an incredible game uh, with an awesome narrative going on and some incredible mechanics, and I'm so excited to share it all with you, as well as this is the first game ever built specifically for Roll20. Um, so everything that we have going on here has been built up with mechanics in Roll20. And it all integrates really, really awesomely and very cool. There's like safety tools built in directly to the game in Roll20, all the character options and like the way you build ships and just there's a lot of awesome stuff I'm really, really excited about. But I guess before we can really dive into all that... Um, we should learn a little bit about the world, um, about what we're doing here. Uh, so Burn Bright is set in a galaxy, like I said, called Alaxis, uh, which is home to a lot of different systems, a lot of different species. All of you are playing adventurers uh, in this world. And adventurer is a term that's pretty common uh, in the galaxy because as you can imagine, as this phenomenon called the burn surrounds the outside edges of the galaxy and always just encroaches further and further, everything it comes in contact with is destroyed or warped or changed in strange ways. Nobody really knows what exactly the burn is. So there's a lot of research going on to try and figure out what it is, but in the meantime, people are fleeing towards the center of the galaxy, always seeking a safe place and never knowing how long a place will be safe. So the Burn Bright, um, it's sort of interesting, the world of this, this galaxy is described in aeons or eras, if you will, that are called brights. Um, so there have been four brights. Uh, we're currently in the fourth bright. It is called the burn bright because it is defined by the burn that is currently happening. Um, so adventurers in this galaxy have a lot to do. There are a lot of people who need help, people who need resources to survive, people who need to move to different planets, um, people who are getting left behind. There's ancient technology that's abandoned floating in the recesses of space. Monsters are also pushing in towards the center of the galaxy as they try and escape the burn. So a lot of people take to space and help those around them however they can. Um, so this game does assume at the very beginning that all of you work together, you all have a ship, you've done at least one mission together probably at some point, but we will go into that a little bit more as we get into the game. But step one for this is creating your characters. Uh, so the goal of the evening, by the end of this session zero, we will have our characters completely done, ready to go, descriptions ready for our artists. It's going to be awesome. So I figure the best way to do that is we are all going to learn together about the species, uh, the class, or not class options, um, the, the ways you can build your character in this world. So here we go. I am going to transition over to another screen. Wow. Gameplay main screen. Woo! Okay. Welcome, everybody. We are now currently inside of our Roll20 campaign, uh, as you can see here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up some of these species options. And let's just get started. Are you all excited to make some characters? So excited. Yeah. So I, much. Oh, my gosh. I have um, a lot of super fun notes. Um, but Darcy, <laughs> please, um, if I miss anything, <laughs> call it out. Call it out. Um, cool. So in this game, there are eight playable species. Um, all of them have honestly incredible powers, um, very um, rich histories about um, how their species originated and then also how they came to interact with Alexis and all of these other species um, across the galaxy. So a lot of uh, learning about these species determines a few things about your character. So let's go ahead and pull up um do you all have roll 20 open yeah we're gonna follow along yay Aww. it's like school read along fun. class read along it's probably exactly what school's like these days okay all right so i'm gonna go ahead and pull up our first option here okay so the driftling yeah um extremely cool here let me move this up here all right so my sort of plan is that we'll go through like each of the species. I'll give you some quick notes. Um, and then after each one, we can talk about what we think, you know, what we think is cool. If, if it's maybe an option for us to consider. Um, and then after we get through all eight, uh, we'll make some deci dis uh, decisions. Sound good? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so for the driftlings, um, these are a very, very, very cool species of shape changers. Um, so basically the way they function is that they integrate uh, pieces of different species that they see or they enjoy. Um, so they're constantly shifting forms. Um, they come from a very, very dangerous home planet that's riddled with monsters and natural hazards. So they banded together pretty early um, to just survive their own planet. Uh, so actually at this point in time when the game picks up, a lot of them have left their home world and travel about the galaxy as mercenaries or, you know, fulfilling other jobs. They're, they love exploration, Um they are, are tend to be very blunt and like direct in their mannerisms because you know they they're constantly changing form. Um, so something they value is like strength of personality. That's how they really like define their individuality by being strong and like you know just being very forward uh, individuals. So what do we think? What do we think about the driftlings? I, mean, I already I think they're really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love, love a shape changer and a shape changer that like doesn't just change like as a whole, but mm -hmm. can do little modifications. That's yeah. Cool. Take yeah. your favorites from different species and everything. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, the their dream. ability. Yeah, especially their ability to gain the special ability of another creature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Very cool. Clearly would be super useful um, during adventures. So that's the Drifling. Yeah. So that's one. Love that one. One of eight. I don't know. Does anybody have any strong feelings about this right out the gate? You think this might be the one, anybody? I, I do already feel like I want to play a Drifling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Drifling. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's great because that can take it off of my ever increasing <laughs> list of list. what's possible. Okay. <laughs> They're too we, good. We've got seven They're to go. Good. Yeah, I, know. I also We're good. love like, the example. One of the example names is Life in Pieces, and it just. <laughs> really speaks but, to me. <laughs> yes. So yeah, poetic. It's on a very deep level. I just feel Truly. it. <laughs> oh my yeah, god. The very next name is musical. Oh, everything about yeah. them is great, but you take them just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So that's our first option. And we're going to move on to our second species, playable species, uh, which are the glean. They're pretty. Look at this them. art is so pretty. It's so pretty. Oh, whenever I can, oh, I can't make it smaller. Why? That's okay. It's cute and scary at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. There's too many eyes for it to only be cute. To only be cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the Gleen, uh, as you might be able to tell, are a feathered aquatic species. Um, and this species in their natural state only lives to be about five years old um, before before they die. They have very short lifespans. Um, but over the course of time, they have come to use these magical devices called reliquaries, which actually allow them to live much, much longer and also kind of um, make it easier for them to move on land or uh, other places that aren't their natural <clears throat> aquatic environment um so and what's interesting about these reliquaries is that these were made um based on six original glean um and every reliquary is a copy of one of those original six so whichever reliquary you have um actually determines a little bit of your personality so you have tendencies like the original glean um that the reliquary was made for so if you do pick a glean you also pick the type of reliquary you have um which gives you certain advantages and certain disadvantages um based on what you have and over the course of a lifetime a glean might choose to move through several different versions of these six um, as they kind of explore and grow um, you know assessing different personality traits that they like um, and the glean uh, yeah yeah no right? no please go on I'll get to uh, you go on <laughs> um, and what's uh, so these the glean are extremely creative extremely innovative um, because they used to live for so short they would devote their whole lives to making beautiful objects and cool inventions and meaningful things um, and they've carried that over that now that they have longer lifespans um, they are known across the universe or the galaxy as being just these incredible crafters um, sometimes almost to a fault it was the glean who initially invented artificial intelligence um, which in the history of Alexis that was a, a big deal um, AI basically rebelled um, rose up it was a time of war disaster um, so artificial intelligence is banned across Alexis um, 
so the Gleans do still do have that uh, in their history, and some people definitely hold grudges uh, about that still. So, what do we think about the Glean? I'm sorry. The Vela Reliquary is just really calling me out in oh, a way no, that I'm not comfortable wait, with. It? Vela <laughs> Reliquaries shine yellow and make the bearer more interested in creating art while also making them more insecure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, it's so good. Uh, I love um, the, the I also, Bulma, which makes you more polite while increasing your appetite. <laughs> just hungry, hungry and polite. So just always hungry. <laughs> um, I also love that these little creatures, uh, so the second bright was the war bright. Mm -hmm. And these little creatures were essentially the, the, the sapients that brought the war bright to an end, yeah. which I think is also really interesting that they use the power, their powers of creation and invention to end you know, a centuries long series of wars across the galaxy. Yeah, I mean, something that's very cool about them too. Um, most people, they the Glean were on the very, very edge of the galaxy. So people didn't really know they existed before they had any spacecraft technology or anything. Um, this ancient being um, called an Omniscient, uh, which is uh, these these beings who basically they're so old they may have been there at the beginning of the galaxy most of them are sleeping somewhere in the earth or have deceased and now actually become magical power um one of these omniscients was the first thing to find the glean and basically loved like they were so curious and creative and innovative uh this omniscient made the reliquaries for the glean um so they could get out there and travel in space and uh kind of fuel um the rest of the the galaxy so they have a really cool relationship um with with these ancient beings so and that being was called black ice koa um which is also just an awesome name <laughs> so i was like yeah. this is rad um yeah so that's the glean anybody everybody feeling, you know? go look up feather stars or crinoids uh they are the creatures that this is sort of morphologically based off of oh, and they have a wild history of us finding them in fossils and then suddenly finding them for real life even weirder than you could have imagined them uh at the bottom of the ocean oh. they're rad Ooh. and so are the glean oh, i love them so much yeah <laughs> Anybody feeling good about the glean? Do we have any glean takers, maybe? It, it's high up on my list, but there's one or two that we're going to get to that are also up there. So I'm curious what we all sort of have mm -hmm. to think about some of the mm -hmm. later ones. But this one's up there for me. Definitely. Yeah, I don't want to cross anything off anyone's list, but there are same like things that I'm <laughs> yeah. drawn to already. But the glean, we... I, I love that it, it just, it kind of helps inform its personality a lot with yeah. just its abilities. Mm -hmm. So it's already filling blanks in my head and that's cool yeah. so i could i could i could do all of them <laughs> i want to play all the races i just want to do that <laughs> well we're only and i two. love that that name oh example God. its name is oodle, oodle. <laughs> so cute oh gosh yeah all right well let's move on to number three the eno eno very cool cat yes. people yeah so uh, the Eno, like you can probably see, um, are a cat-like uh, <clears throat> species, um, and basically they are they are really well known for their talents with uh, sub subterfuge, diplomacy, deception. Um, the Eno have a, a long history where basically at, at a certain point in time they went out and they conquered a whole bunch of planets. Uh, so they had a, a bunch of places they ruled over and when the burn came, you know, it was sort of like a hit the deck situation. Um, so they, they retreated a lot into their own societies, which are already very complicated. Um, basically, I mean, the Eno don't even use money. They trade in a system of favors um, for everyone. So it's always about like what you owe me. If I do this for you, what do you have to do for me? Very like um, dealing in favors society. Um, there are four ruling families uh, for the Eno that everybody is born into one of these families that establishes a lot about your loyalties, um, you know, what what resources you have. Um, so the Eno um, during the War Bright, uh, they they always played their own side, uh, which is something that they sort of continue to do to this day, um, looking out for their interests and and their families. Um, but the ones who do go out adventuring in the world, um, skilled diplomats, skilled subterfuge, like um, you know, Eno can talk you into anything, and they never forget a favor owed. 
Um, so, so that's the Eno. Uh, what do we think? This is one I'm super drawn to. <laughs> I love how charismatic they are. And yeah, they just seem very, uh, maybe not, maybe not community oriented, but I do like that they are fighting for their, for their own interests and their families and everything like that, but still know how to please the people around them. Oh yeah, definitely. I really like the, you know, and I like that one of the houses is dedicated to like stopping the burns advance. Yeah. I think that would make for mm -hmm. a really cool like character story. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So moving on, we are getting to the Kuthuk. Kuthuk? Kithuk. Hmm. Kithuk. There we go. Sure. Um, all right. Which are uh, bug people. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, so the Kithik, um, they, as you can kind of see, they, they have chitinous shells. Um, they actually do stand very large. Uh, I think this, this photo is a little deceiving. They stand between six and seven feet tall. So they're like giant ants. Um, and the thing about them, they are extremely community oriented. Um, for them, it's all about fighting together, living together, getting things done together. Like the same way you would think of an ant colony is definitely um, dead they are so interconnected and all about uh, supporting each other um, and their planet uh, their home planet Kytus was actually destroyed already by the burn and so unfortunately these people are really forced into kind of wandering the galaxy looking for a place to live because there's so many of them they live in such large communities they require a great deal of space and resources so a lot of planets refuse to take in uh, the Kithuk so it's it's really a a story of them constantly looking for a place to call home and belong. Um, so they're, they're sort of a, a tragic species in that way. Um, but they are renowned as being incredible fighters, um, especially when paired with, with other people. They're all about support. Um, yeah, incredibly generous, warm-hearted uh, species. So yeah, that's them. Anybody thinking about bug person? We got, we got one more bug species, but this, they're, they're both, they're very different. <laughs> There's some folks in the chat who are objecting strenuously really? to this no? race. Yes, yeah. it's very funny. <laughs> what do they say? Um, I can't I think... see chat. <laughs> oh, it's okay. They're no. just saying nope, nope, nope. Seven nope. foot tall ant is a nope. <laughs> oh, just you wait. I'm sorry. The last one. I'm very excited yeah. to tell you about. <laughs> yeah. <for sure. laughs> I think they're super interesting. I, you know, the, uh, the idea of um, like long lived communal fighters is sort of a novel thing that I think is cool. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's for me. I just never sort of gravitate towards fighters, but I think the idea of like having this kind of a society behind them is super interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like an Uncle Iroh type, right? Like yeah. this, oh. war, you know, warrior who's sort of, you know, a little older might be yeah. kind of fun to play. He's seen a lot of the world. Yeah. Very cute. Yeah. I'm I definitely love... drawn to its fighting style. The yeah. fact that it likes to support and work with others. Yeah. I That's love nice. that yeah. um, as a coming of age right for the species, um, they carve two notches like in, in their shells so they can actually link together in big combat to make these like big shield walls with each other. So that's like uh, a coming of age right, which I just think is so, so cool and touching. That's um, cool. All right. Sweet. Well, then let us move on to the Peacecraft, <laughs> who are not Warforged, but they are Peacecraft. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, yes. Who's that big boy? Big boys. Um, yes, these are organic uh, sapient, uh, sapient mecha, uh, which is so cool. Um, these these peace crafts stand between 15 and 30 feet tall, and they actually have a space in them built for somebody to sit inside um, them, which is, is very cool. Uh, so the peace craft have this very, very storied history um, over over the brights uh, of, of Alexis, which of course have experienced a lot of war, a lot of turmoil. Uh, there was a planet called Pax, and basically this planet decided that the best way to win the war was to invent these peace craft um, that they would use as weapons and dominate each other and you know the, the old story goes so they did that and of course the packs ended up getting completely wiped out um, all the people who built the peace craft uh, no longer exist their cities are ruined um, but the peace craft still live on packs and they were horrified by the war everything so they are strictly anti-war they refuse to get involved in any war and right now they actually serve a lot of um 
you can find a lot of them in an adventurer capacity or just helping out people, um, bringing supplies, medicine, flying around, helping people. Um, it's sort of interesting. Their world PAX now is strictly off limits to everyone except the Peacecraft. Um, they have their servers there that where they, um, they're they constantly backing up information and their personalities on the server on the home planet. So the Peacecraft are actually sort of immortal because whenever a Peacecraft dies, they simply download the personality, they build a new body and put it back in there. Um, but they also have a strict rule that no more Peacecraft can be built. So there are about 10,000 of them right now and that's all there ever will be, according to the Peacecraft, um, for a variety of reasons, but also one being they aren't quite sure how to replicate the process of how they were made. Um, they think they could, but right now there's basically a ban that's been put on it um, that has recently come into question with the burn because any Peacecraft that flies into the burn is wiped from the system. So it's true death for the first time that they're ever now having to face. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the peace craft. Um, so there will be long lived, um, pretty much immortal sort of species. They're huge. Um, <laughs> yeah. What do we think about the peace craft? My, I think my favorite thing about the peace craft is when you get down to special abilities, the first one is you can fly. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, so, like, if someone played a peace craft, would they, like, that person is our ship? <laughs> <laughs> no, you all do get a ship, um, but you can do a lot of really cool things. <laughs> with you can a pull craft. an Aslan and just come into battle and go, ride me. <laughs> <laughs> you can. You can totally put someone inside your suit. Uh, like, I do a protect. Like, it's, yeah, they're very, there's, very cool. <laughs> there's a lot of conversation about uh, putting a glean adventure inside, oh my God, the, cute. inside the, the mech, too, oh, to protect them. Glean and Krang. My glean heart. And craft. Oh, and that's now... Krang. That is Krang from Ninja Turtles. Oh, we did it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> Everything old is new again. Uh, here we are. We're just, there's nothing new in this world. <laughs> Oh, very cool. So that is the peace craft. Oh, let me, oh my gosh, tabs. Oh, okay. All right. And next up, we have the Ronin, who are, wait for it, bugs. More bugs. They are Like bugs. lots more bugs. Lots, lots more bugs. bugs. Um, so the Ronin are actually um, collectives of insects that share one consciousness. Um, so they, they call these uh, insects that band together hives. So each Roranan is actually a hive of about 100,000 of these beetles. Um, and that's that's what they are. They can obviously change their form uh, to, you know, appear in different ways and to pick up objects, you know, like you would uh, anything else. But, I mean, the, the hive is very drawn to stay together. Um, they get really upset and scattered um, if they are too far apart. So, of course, there are some limitations on this. Um, the Roranan is also, their, their story is pretty tragic as well. Um, their home planet... And named Vama has also been swallowed up by the burn um, and along with it on their planet was their queen who was just basically this giant huge beetle who established all of them to have one awesome giant consciousness so you didn't used to have individual hives of Roranan they were all one uh, one being the entire species um, so when the planet was lost to the burn that connection was severed um, and basically all the bugs that were saved from there, like they had to go through extensive psychological care and treatment to reestablish their own individual small collectives or these hives to make these individuals because it was so traumatic being torn apart from this greater consciousness. Uh, so now Ronan, uh, they, you know, wander the galaxy trying to basically find a solution, um, how to reestablish, you know, the species as one collective link. Um, just, you know, and they all have different ideas about about how to do that, you know, ancient mysteries to uncover, places to go, research to be done. Um, so it's it's always an ever evolving quest. Um, the Roranan do tend to see their adventuring companions as part of their hive symbolically. So they really like to adopt people and take care of people. So they have a tendency to just maybe mother people around them. Once you're accepted, you know, you're you're part of them and they've got your back. Um, so that's the Roranan. I love them. Yeah, they're very cool. Yeah. yeah. 
they're so at the cool. top of the list too i think they're so cool and there's so many cool uh like creative ways to use them yes mm-hmm. so many yeah. different scenarios yeah. i i think that's very cool yeah i mean yeah. like yeah oh go for it not to get to current events but like also i i very much feel the like i feel viscerally the getting separated from your people in a way that i didn't maybe yeah. when we've we were first coming up with these right sure um so i don't know i think that could be really interesting to play these days right yeah i could bring a lot to sure. that definitely being being driven by that constant like want to reestablish, you know this this great link this great community um i think that's a very powerful choice <sighs> but that's only two or three bug races <laughs> we've got, <laughs> we've got the worst one uh, uh, coming up. It's right. Maybe best. You all will love it. I know it. Um, but anyway, before we get there, we have the Olran. So the Olran um, are crystalline humanoids who basically, as they age, their form gets harder and harder, um, re- eventually reaching a point where they can no longer move and they <clears throat> basically die as they become completely solid. Um, so the Olran have a lot a lot of dark history um, going on over the brights because their planet uh, Marthong is the only place you can uh, harvest this this material um, called ooh, doo, doo, oh, Kala. Um, and Kala basically what it can do it can conduct magic. Um, so it's an extremely valuable commodity as, um, cause magic is something that is literally mined, um, in the galaxy. So as planets are destroyed and mining spots are destroyed, the resources are getting less and less. So having Kala, um, really extends the life of your magic power. Uh, and since their home planet is the only place you can find it, there's been a long history of wars and raids and people trying to take their resources and destroy their planet and get at it to make matters worse. Marthong actually sits in the very center uh, of Alaxis, which is, of course, the most desirable place to be since the burn is surrounding from all sides and compressing. Um, So their society is just constantly trying to keep its borders closed, trying to keep people from using and abusing them and their resources. Um, So this has given rise to a culture of of warriors, honestly. Like, um, military service is required for everybody, so everybody trains, you know, field medics or on the ground warriors or tacticians or everybody has some kind of, of military service. Um, they really, really prize heroes and like monuments uh, to, to past victories or to remarkable heroes. Um, they have a very long memory and a pride in their own people and their own ability to survive. Um, it's also seen that adventurers who are Olran, who are out in the galaxy, aren't really understood because a lot of people are like, why would you leave the safest place in the galaxy to go to go out? Um, so if you do choose to be uh, an Olran, you definitely have to think about why you would have left um, your your home and your society to, to go elsewhere. What the Olran think? are yeah. also the ones that discovered uh, plasma and magic, right? That's also on one of their moons was the first plasma yes. well. So they so have they just really got it all against them, bless. Yes, they have a ton, a ton of resources. Um, were they, they were the ones who were responsible for MI, right? Darcy? I believe so, but yeah, I very yeah. quickly read a lot of this, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't hold me to it, but I think okay. you might be right. Okay. Um, so basically the Olran uh, were definitely, I think, responsible for d- discovering MI, which unlike artificial intelligence, this is magic intelligence, uh, which is currently what is used to fuel ships. Um, basically the, the whole process involves summoning like a magic being that you bind to starships. Um, and this being is capable of propelling the ships through space. Um, so your ship that we will be making later has an MI, uh, an intelligence that pilots and like takes cares of all the functions of your ship. So as a team, we will name this MI um, and kind of give them personality. Uh, but the Olran are largely responsible for that. Okay, what do we think about them? They've got a lot going on. Crystal they're like, people. Yeah, they're crystal people. Also. And like they're they're like age as they they harden as they age and this like I'm just imagining like cathedrals of like your old wise sort of loved ones and these enormous yeah. sort of artifacts to yeah. like long lives. It's just fascinating to me. Just the the aesthetics of this species 
are rocking. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> I was saying I was saying earlier, so a common practice because as they harden, as they age, uh, once they become so hard that you know they're they're basically dead, um, they give their bodies to create a shield that surrounds the planet. So all the ancestors are actually physically giving their bodies after they die to create a defensive sphere around the planet, which is so metal. Um, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Extremely <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> They are, in a way, eternal mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's them. All right. And our final... Oh, boy. Oh, um, boy. I'm just going to tell you all now. I have a thing about slugs <laughs> in real life. Oh, I didn't they, know that. They scare me. Um, so when, oh. I, when I opened up to the species, I was like, oh, no. Um, but they are very, very cool. Uh, this is the Zavoy. Oh, yes. Hello. <laughs> Giant so I was a snailologist. Uh, so I studied slugs and snails. So uh, my heart, but I, I did not create this creature. I think James it was yeah. His uh, James, and... the lover of flumps. Oh, I'm sure this uh-huh. was him. Yeah, right? Look uh-huh. At uh-huh. It. Uh-huh. I looked at it. and I was like, oh yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what the this precious is about. babes. So the Zavoy, um, as you can see, they're about four to five feet long, uh, white slugs, um, and. They uh they live they come from a planet. Uh, let me make sure I get all these names right. Uh, Murtoth, uh from the planet Murtoth, which is still in existence, but basically it's like right on the edge of the burn. So any any day any year now the burn could change and consume their planet. Um, but the Zavoy, so most of the Zavoy have abandoned it they don't they don't live there there is still a small colony that like tries you know to remain to their home world and is dedicated to staying there um a lot of that passion for the world comes from the fact that the zavoy are really about conservation and recycling was a is a huge thing for them so at a certain point in their history they were you know functioning as any like normal species you know industrial revolution blah destroying their planet with technology and there came a hard point in time where basically things were so messed up that they're like oh god we have to change our ways and there was a giant cultural shift to embrace like environmentalism and conservation um so the society is known across the galaxy as having like all of these awesome practices um, for this, including a specific practice that they can do <clears throat> where the Zavoy <laughs> can transform their forms um, to occupy dead bodies uh, and then animate them, which is another function for them of recycling. Um, they tend to get upset when, when, <laughs> when people are like, why would you do that? They're, they're like, I don't understand. This person is dead. Like, I need to use this body. You know, it's just, it's all about recycling, you know? Um, so they make incredible, like, spies um, or uh, serve other amazing functions because they can just completely occupy um, the corpses of uh, spe- humanoid-esque species, uh, also some animals. There's uh, a lot of capabilities they can do. Um, the Zavoy are generally, um, they, they, they're creative. They really like to embrace life and life's pleasures. Um, they're always encouraging people to grow and like create and explore things and enjoy the moment. Um, they also just generally don't like authority. Um, it bothers them. Uh, there's, there's like a phrase in the galaxy, like the fastest way to get a Zavoy to do something is to tell them to do the opposite. Um, so that's Good. sort of, <laughs> sort of <laughs> them um, in a nutshell. So what do I we love, think? I love, yeah. I love everything so about them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love their like weird, cute little faces. Little I faces. love that they can just like, they just like possess dead corpses. Mm-hmm. It's basically a giant yerk. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only gods. That is exactly what they are. <laughs> It's the, definitely like what I went through this list. It was for me, it was like Drifflings, Zavoy, and then like all the rest are, are cool, but like nothing else even comes close to the two of those. Yeah. I, I just love Zavoy. <laughs> yeah. I, the, all of it. I'm all, into it. All of this. Love this. Everything that's going on here. Love it. Love, love it's it. like weird, cute slug face. Yes. Love that it will use dead bodies. Love it. <laughs> I'm going to need a yeah. minute or two to get free of that yerk uh, yeah. call out because that's 
perfect and the most nostalgic I felt in like six hours. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I knew that there was no way I was getting out of this character creation without somebody I'm making. So one. sorry. <laughs> I really do almost feel bad about how much. No, I want to play it's them fine. All. No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm they not. Are no, cute. I will say I'm not married. They are very to it. cute. They are. Uh, um, I will. I'm not say. married to it yet. This is I'm the cutest what we're gonna... I've ever seen. <laughs> if no one was gonna choose it, I was gonna choose it just to upset you. So oh my God. Uh, you were you were in court no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Friendship. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you and I gotta play games together more. <laughs> we've made, we've chosen glad, all the same races for many. Of I'm the same glad reasons. it's happening now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, bringing awesome people together over slugs <laughs> and my pain. Uh, so that is the Zavoy, which brings us to that's all of the the species. Um, I will say, if you do play a Zavoy, you will have to get familiar with the other species, um, yeah. considering you can occupy their bodies and learning how that works. Um, so. <laughs> There's that to keep in mind. Probably so. same with the driftlings too, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so those are the oh, eight. Sure. Everyone, what mm -hmm. are you gonna choose? Did we want to oh. talk about like campaign tone? Oh yeah, or that's any, a, Were there any yeah. themes that you wanted to throw at me? Because I have some ideas. But... Yeah, that is a great, great uh, thing to do. So for this game, we will actually be playing through a module um, that is called Burning Daylight. Um, this module in particular does deal with some darker themes. There are some serious things going on. Um, it deals a lot with uh, zealotry, um, with religion, um, with, you know, how far will some people go um, in the face of the burn, what their ideas are, where they'll push. Um, so there are those themes to consider. Um, but of course, you know, it, there is absolutely room for some lighthearted stuff. Um, this just, this isn't a Saturday morning cartoon uh, campaign that we're looking at. So, and like I said, um, we all are starting with the assumption that you all have worked together before. You already do have a ship when we start the game. Um, so if we do also want to think about some relationships, um, you know, building that in, uh, how we all have survived together, which should probably be something, maybe not characters who directly, you know, loathe each other, or if they do, it's a, it's a thing, you know, <laughs> any questions yeah. about the tone before we make any, any kind of decisions? No, that's helpful for me. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, Who's gonna I don't do think it? we heard from you, Darcy, about what I mean. I know you had a hand in all in some of these. Oh yeah. Pieces, but I don't think we heard from you what you are really drawn to. Mm. I'm between um, the absolutely stealing from the idea of like Uncle Iroh, kind of older mm -hmm. Kathuk, mm -hmm. yeah. um, or uh, a Glean. I like love their abilities. I love their weird little bodies. Yeah. I just love them. Yeah. I know Chewie. You're very sad. <laughs> I'm talking about other cute creatures. Uh, other than you. So I'm between trade. those two, yeah. but I'd be happy with either. So what are other people feeling? Yeah. We're all too polite. See me, you go, because I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I said earlier before we went live that I'm, I've been really hoping to play a cat-like creature just because cats, uh, I've recently become a cat mother and I've oh, yes. finished watching uh she-ra and i love <laughs> okay. i love that yeah. <laughs> that cat character um and i was ex so excited to see that there's one in this system so i'm really drawn between eno and the Rornan. i think mm. either one of those two i'd have a lot of fun sure playing yeah i mean like i said earlier as well any of them would be fun but those are the two that are at the top of my list I think I'm I'm between Driftling and Zavoy. Mm -hmm. And if I play a Zavoy, then I can just inhabit a Driftling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I uh, I also just like being a lore and mechanics nerd like I am that like, well, whatever. Uh, I think like playing a Zavoy and having to be at least a little familiar with all of them would also be super fun. And if we have a Zavoy in the party, too, yeah. Oh, that's true. Oh, well. <laughs> well torn between what are you, two. Just what we are you have the interests. Yeah. I'm, I'm also torn between Drifling and Zavoy. Um, so. I'm sorry. What I meant was Glean and Zavoy. I got those oh, confused. Gotcha. Mm. Yes, because I have them written on my page in the opposite order of the way that we just went through them, which is fairly confusing to me. Don't know how I managed that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, right. uh, Jess, you're going drift. You, are you going to go drifting? Do you think? 
Um, I think so. Since Drifling doesn't seem to be the top of anyone else's list, that and that's definitely like one of the top choices for me. I think I'm gonna go with Drifling, okay. unless someone else feels very strongly that they want it. Oh God, making these I'm decisions the in front of people. I'm oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm deciding. I love that. <laughs> yes. So Eugenio going Glean. Oh, oh, is that is that what you is that what you like? <laughs> Oh, I don't. Or is a void? No, no, by all means. No, I know. I'm just giving you a hard time about the about the slugs. Um, I'm leaning a little bit Zavoy, but but I want to. Uh, God, they're all so good, and we just can't play all eight. Um, you know what? I'm just gonna bite the bullet and say I'm gonna go Zavoy. Okay. All right. So we have a Zavoy, Kuthuk, uh, and Nasim. I am really struggling to pick. <laughs> I'm sorry I left you with the two that you said you wanted most. I didn't help you at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> man, Rornan are weird. I'll do a Rornan. That's cool. Woo, weird. Right. Rornan, right. Zavoy, Kithic. So and... should we, would it be helpful? Should we pop into our little character mancers and yes, start doing this? Yes, everybody. We are going to do this the live. are yeah. so cool. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, sweet. And then Jess, you were going drifling? Cool. Yep. All right. So yeah, cool. So that's the hardest decision. Um, I mean, there are still a lot more decisions we have to make. No, it's but... not. Naming our it's ship hard. is going to be the hardest yeah, decision. Yeah, true. Truly. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I have made an example um, character in here. So I'm just going to open this up. Um, so all of you should have um, your characters on the screen. I went ahead and made, uh, you can grab these from the compendium. Right? No, no. From the, um, the journal. journal. So all of you grab the ones I put your name on. Uh, you have all the permissions to change it and do all that fun stuff. Um, so we're going to get to this screen here, which is this awesome, awesome tool that just helps you build your characters. And it's great. <laughs> and I love it. Uh, so we're going to start here and click next because we're ready. We've already done the hard part and we've picked our species. So when you have those, just go ahead and do the drop down. Um, I will go ahead and I'll make a glean as my example. Sweet. Um, okay, and then once we have that picked, we're ready to move on to culture. So um, what's really interesting about this game is that uh, your species gives you certain inherent abilities. Of course, um, you will get to pick those later on. Um, so starting out, you end up getting to pick two, uh, something called Nova abilities, and then one species ability in addition to what you automatically get. Um, and then the other thing that determines sort of your stats is your culture. Um, so already built into the game, there are several example cultures of things that exist. Um, so if you do want to check out for the races you pick or the species you picked, that's going to be a hard one to unlearn, uh, for the species that you picked, um, maybe checking out where they live. All of those systems are currently in here. Um, so like, for example, let's see. Like the pack system, if you're playing a piece craft, they already recommend these things. Um, but basically, there are a few different parts to culture um, that will break down to influence your character sheet here. So there's borders, there's density, there's diversity, and economics. Um, and all four of these things have a few different options that mean different things for your characters. So let's go ahead here and I'm going to click on borders just so we can go over them. Okay, so for borders, uh, what this means is that for your culture, wherever you grew up or what influenced you most, um, the borders of that place are actually going to affect your character. So if the borders were open, which means you had a lot of traffic coming in from different places, uh, so you were exposed to a lot of different kinds of people, um, you, maybe you had refugees in your culture, um, so your, your home place was more accepting of taking in people running from the burn. Um, that's one option. Uh, you have selective, which is, you know, it's very hard for people to integrate into your society. Um, maybe people have to specifically apply to, to, you know, get to live where you are. Um, and then, of course, isolationist, where they maybe allow just visits, but people don't really live um, of other species uh, where you come from. So this would be someone like the Peacecraft who, like, do not allow anyone <laughs> to live um, on their planet except for the Peacecraft. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, looking at these these culture sets here, do you all feel drawn to any of the ones that already exist, or are we feeling more creating our own? Because both are kind of totally up to you. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize you could change those. Yeah, if you want. Oh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, especially because, like, some people, like the Roranan, for example, like, where they've spent the most time, I mean have you always lived like are you are you newer like did you spend a lot of time somewhere else or are you you know your whole culture is based on your living on the home planet that was destroyed um you can definitely answer these questions for yourself mm -hmm. um yeah so that's one aspect uh, of culture is the borders the uh, second aspect of it is the density um do 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 building culture uh Borders. Diversity is the one. Wait, is density on there too? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. It just goes out of order. Okay, so population density, if you came from an urban place, it's going to affect your stats different because, um, you know, you were around a lot of people, a lot of different people all the time. Um, if you're from a suburban culture, so not so crowded, uh, that definitely influences your stats. Uh, rural as well. Um, so those are all decisions to make. Um, and then in terms of diversity, of course, we have like a ton of diversity where you grew up around a lot of other species and constantly had them in your life. Um, so that's, that's inclusive. Um, partitioned is when you had maybe like on the same planet, you had two species, but they didn't live together. They like shared the planet, um, but only interacted maybe on a basis of, trade or or fighting or something of that nature um and then you have homogenous which is again only one species lives on the planet um so this might be something more like the the you know uh who who really kind of keep in their own family structures and then economic status uh we have wealthy if you come from somewhere probably closer in the center of the galaxy you're probably wealthier um intermediate you know you're doing okay uh and then poor so this is probably like the kuthik who you know are constantly moving from place to place and uh, having trouble with resources so those are sort of the the options that you can all choose madly clicking through these to see yeah what they're so cool i have to call out um i i forget how to pronounce it but golgi the magnificent which yes. is like built out of the a space station built out of the corpse of an ancient omniscient, omniscient yeah. and it's just the best uh so i i think i i'm kind of drawn toward Sela. um it's an open inclusive yeah. and um intermediately wealthy place that's very urban and um I, i'm just imagining if i'm sort of playing this character who be you know had spent a long time as like a mercenary or sort of had a lot of fighting behind them um you know, maybe they, you know, maybe they were raised a lot on this very cosmopolitan area and that's where they were taking a lot of this work. So, yeah. you know, maybe they were, grew up in more of a, maybe, maybe they're in a small colony of Kithuk on Sela. Yeah. And um, yeah, that has, it used to be a refugee camp, but now it's like a very cool, like adventurers hub. So it would be kind of fun to have um, some footing there. Yeah. I think definitely. that's what I'm drawn to. Yeah. That's the one that I'm most drawn to as well. Yeah. I really like Sela. Well, Join that, me on Sela. Yeah, that could be your connection <laughs> as to why you know each other later if you if you did grow up in the same area. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking for uh, for cultures that have either inclusive or at the very least partitioned diversity because mm. I think I want my little Zavoy to not so little uh, to it's have quite large. sort of <laughs> quite large uh, to have sort of grown up uh, around the different sapients that that now I, I so that I have a passing familiarity with sort of how they work and what they do and who they are. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. A lot of the ones that I'm finding are sort of these like dead worlds, uh, the ones that are that are in yeah, the world's inclusive diversities. I which mean, is interesting. Yeah. Uh... When you're worried about surviving, <laughs> doesn't so much matter. <laughs> Yeah, Who's it's, around you? Um, I mean, Alexis, you know, there are so many people who are displaced. Um, so that's a very, very common part of, of being in this world. There are constant refugees, you know, living in the streets or flooding into the city. Issues of immigration are, are huge um, as people just have mm. to retreat, you know, from these line of planets. Because the burn, while it is, you know, around the full 
all directions of the galaxy. Um, suddenly, some parts of it will jump forward at a rapid rate. Um, others will like move in strange ways. It, it doesn't move in a geometric, nice, tightening circle. Um, it's this very erratic border. So, um, so planets and systems get swallowed that nobody was expecting um, mm. just randomly. Uh, it is estimated that, you know, there's probably another millennia or so before the whole galaxy is actually consumed fully, but that uncertainty has people panicked and a lot of people trying to cram into not a lot of space um, on most of these planets, so. I'm kind of fascinated by the Drite system, which is the center of Alaxis. Mm -hmm. Um and sort of the idea that it, it what happened in the Drite system, Drite system uh, when it became the center of the burn, uh, how sort of this rural, verdant, agricultural land, which I feel like as a boy would be super into, yeah. uh, was sort of decimated, or at least the central planet was decimated by the overguilds and the the all of these other peoples coming in. Yeah. So I think I might go with the Drite system because I think there's a lot of meat there for like someone trying to activism. fix yeah 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 definitely um yeah and the over guilds um there are five merchant guilds that basically control a ton of the resources in the galaxy um there's a lot of crime that happens because of them pulling resources you know having these these battles over planets and resources uh with each other they drag everybody into their <laughs> their politics um so the overguilds are definitely a source of a lot of contention and um cer certainly yeah draining resources uh from local populations so i think that makes a lot of sense yeah i like it okay sweet all right we feeling good about our cultures cool i think so all right let's go ahead then and move on to story so this is something I really, really, really enjoy about this game, um, is that all of you are going to be selecting something called the story path. Um, and s fulfilling your story path is actually how you level um, in this game. Um, as you complete achievements for your story path, you get to increase certain skills or take on more abilities, um, just depending on what your path is. And there's a lot of different options on these paths, and they are all, um, you know, narrative things that basically we will hit these keystones of as we're going through. So for an example, like one... Um, let's just start with like uh, beast friend. Um, so as an example, beast friend, it's all about a story path about bonding with an animal um, who, you know, basically becomes your friend and that sort of evolves. So like the first event, um, you complete this event after you meet an animal and show it some form of kindness. Um, so basically, while we are playing through the module of this game, you all are also on your own journeys as dictated by your story path. So things are happening with your character as you advance along this path. Um, the general rate uh, that's expected for these is that one character per session will hit a story path. Um, mm -hmm. So once you decide what these are, um, I will work to incorporate these elements into the game um, and they will appear. So there's a lot of really cool options on here. Um, everything from like, yeah, love to like mentor, you know, if you're on the run, uh, revenge, smuggling, just survive. Uh, there's a lot of different things in here that definitely inform what kind of character you're going to be playing and what sort of your secondary goals are or your primary goals. And this adventure happens to be your secondary. So... This Any is one thoughts? of my favorite parts yeah. of the game. This is, uh, I love yeah. I love that this is how you advance. Um, I also love that it it constantly you know forces the GM to like check back in and develop those plots like in those subplots for the characters. It, I think it's that's a way so to good. show our characters love letter to the game, right? It's yeah. our way to tell you the GM, you know how how we want to how we want to go. Yeah. It's great. Uh, yeah, I love this. I love this so much. I'm really excited. Do you, any of you have any that like just stand out for you? Uh, yeah, I, I think for my path that I'm leaning towards is generally along the lines of uh, either preservation or um, oh, where was that other one? Let's look at preservation. Um, gain gaining followers or uh -huh. uh, survive. Mm -hmm. those three kind of 
sound like where I'm going yeah. with the Roranan. Very yeah, cool. They're just all so evocative and like I, we have to call out the the love path, which is it's, amazing. Yeah. yeah, and it's here in this game. It, uh, oh, God. I also like the become famous one, just because. Yeah, funny. Just become yeah. Famous. that's a, become that's famous. A, that's, <laughs> that's a glean with the Vela reliquary right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so insecure. <laughs> I'm so insecure, but could you like follow me? Oh, that's real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, follow me, please. But like, follow me, please. Uh, gosh, I know I just talked about like coming to uh, coming to the Drite system for like environmental activism, mm -hmm. but that double life is just really calling to me, particularly as a mm. Savoy. Yeah. Oh, cool. Like maybe I've been living yeah. for a while in, in the body of yeah. someone else. Ooh, very cool. And so it wasn't until the four of us got together that I could finally shed that body but like keep it in storage just in case yeah because <laughs> because of we're terrible <laughs> i mean great um, i mean you can't oh i guess this is something that body right hello r-a-c-y-c-l-e recycle um yeah. they although this is actually something that i would then do going forward yes. but that's okay because that i've just got ahead of myself in the story yeah i'm a little tempted to that one i'm gonna click through some of the other ones but that's sort of what i'm leaning towards right now yeah yeah, and what is really cool is, like, that that first path that honestly, like, really sets you on the whole thing, like, the, you know, beast friend, You the first path is actually meeting a beast, so that mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet, right? That would be, like, during our first game, I would introduce, like, a sad dog or something, and then the journey would begin from there. Because I was also, you know, having... <laughs> Like, oh, like, I'm not on this path yet, but this is going to be the path I see forward for my character. Uh-huh. I'm definitely very drawn to Beast Friend. Oh, yeah. I just love the idea of this, like, this this creature who constantly changes their shape, mm -hmm. just, like, befriending an animal who's always just like, who is this? Where is the person that I yeah. befriended? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. oh. Oh. And just having to be like, no, no, still me, right? It's still me. And, like, you don't smell forming any. a very strong <laughs> yeah. bond mm -hmm. with this beast so it recognizes my character, like, whenever they transform. Heck, yeah. There, there's something to there's also a stranger in a strange land which fits very well with like the driftlings desire to just like see every kind of culture yeah so i'm sort of torn between those two right now very cool yeah yeah and then i mean um so you can also you know look at the the rewards you get for hitting these paths each one has about five i think or all of them definitely have five events um, some of them you have to do in order, some are interchangeable, um, so there's a lot of flexibility about how these might evolve um, over the course of the game, and then um, looking at what will change for your character, too. Are there any, and I know this isn't necessarily uh, how we would ideally go about picking these stories, but because this is like a showcase and a particular thing, are there any for you, Celeste, that would be super helpful if like one of us took to tell this story? And certainly, I mean, obviously, we're all experienced. We all can tell our own stories, however they go. But like, I don't know, since we're showcasing this, is there something that might be cool for you to play with? Honestly, at this point, I'm just so open to seeing how this works. Sure. And I'm so excited sure. about it that I, I, it's, it's all in your court. Um, I'm really excited to do the GM work of like, how do these work into the story? And then how do these become right. part of the bigger narrative? Um, so no, I can't help you. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm yeah. pretty happy with double life, but I, I was just curious if that, you know. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah. Okay, sweet. We feeling like we have something? Darcy, what are you? We oh my God, I'm you. so torn. I'm so sorry. I'm like very drawn to these, uh, like kind of a company or a rebellion. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I'm drawn to a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think I'm going to pick mystery and mm -hmm. I'll figure out what it is later on that's very Maybe mysterious something about yeah. the ship i don't know i i would i dig mystery Heck it's yeah. cool i love it yes yes all right sweet well then moving along let's look at skills oh okay boy. so a little bit about how this game works um so everything in this game is based off of uh skills that you all have um you all have 12 16 
I don't have a sheet in front of me. Um, you all have a certain number of skills that you all have. Um, and then these skills are broken down into three basic types. You have your social skills, you have your physical skills, and then you have your mental skills. Um, so looking on here, you can see like, you know, you have your different types of mental skills, computers, engineering, medicine, knowledge, perception, street, web. you get the point. Um, but over the course of this character creation, we're going to be assigning how good we are um, is is the size of dice that you use um so the most basic uh dice anybody can have in something is a d4 uh that means that you just you have no real training or skills in that in particular um and over time as you're like leveling up through these story paths you will be increasing the size of the dice as you get better at things how dice rolls work in this game uh is that you will always be rolling a minimum of two of a certain type of die. So say, for example, uh, one of you was trying to hack a computer um, and I'll say, okay, like, you know, there's this hacking job, whatever. You tell me what kind of skills you want to use. You can make a case for any of the skills involved. There is no specific skill ever assigned to a task. Um, so, you know, there, there are some skills like you might think, oh yeah, well, I'll always use melee in combat. You can also use a ton of different things you could take some perception you could do streetwise there's it's all this game is all about negotiating how you want to use the skills to do what you want to do making a case to me as the gm and then me educating what happens like if that if that makes sense um there's a lot of flexibility with all of these skills um so if you did decide you know hey i want to use my computer skill to hack this computer i'll say okay it's like a difficulty three and so what that means is that you have to roll three of the whatever dice size you have in the computer skill. So say you're moderate at it, so you have like a d6. Um, since the difficulty is three, you have to roll three d6. Um, this system assumes that you succeed. It gives you a pretty good chance of succeeding. The only way you fail is if you get double rolls of anything. So when you roll the three dice, if you get two fours, you fail. Um, if you get two fives, you fail. Um, so that's cool. sort of how all the rules work. So as long as you don't get doubles, anything you do succeeds. Um, and so the way the, the game and difficulties work is that everything is a minimum of two, uh, in terms of like the challenge to accomplish. Uh, and it goes all the way up to seven, which would basically be like an impossible task. Um, because each time you add a dice, y your rate of success gets infinitely harder. <laughs> So, but like, cool. you know, if you have, yeah, a D12 in a skill, you're way less likely to get doubles um, on a roll of, you know, a two or a three. So that's sort of how things work. Um, so the skills that you are going to be good at or that you get, you know, bonuses from, from your species or whatever, um, those are going to be higher numbers. So you're going to be rolling, you know, D8s, D12s. Um, it's also really interesting that uh, when you, you know, advance, um, you can never raise the same dice or you have to make sure you have at least two of a different dice type. So basically you can't just keep putting raising, like if you have a D6 in melee, you can't go up to a D8 unless something else across the board is also at a D6. So basically you're oh. forced to diversify your skills. Um, so you can't just put all of your resources into one thing. It does. It's a little bit hard to wrap your brain around, but I promise it does make sense when we when we <laughs> when we get there. So basically, you can't just like invest all in one skill. You have to raise up your skills kind of evenly across the board. Oh my goodness! This has it's very this cool. Little, right? It's very cool. This little skill info panel. If you scroll down, it has a table of percentages of possible success yeah. based on your die size and complexity. Yeah. And I'm obsessed with data. It's beautiful. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's also saves me doing it because you know I would have. Yep. Uh, I love that. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. So like you can see on the screen here, like a two. Yeah, that would be super easy. That means you're just rolling two dice. Um, so your chances are pretty good, even if you have just a D4. Um, yeah, seven being ridiculous because your chances of getting doubles rolling seven dice is of any kind is pretty, it's pretty high. Um, yeah, all the probability. Ooh, math nerds, look. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm so excited about. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
And then, you know, what's also really cool about this game is, you know, the way we interpret successes and failures. Um, that's very much on you all, um, since mm. it's sort of we're really sharing the narrative about control. So when things do fail, um, you know, I'll always ask you, you first, what does that look like? What do you think that failure looks like? Um, mm. And, you know, if I if I really think there should be something extra spicy on there, maybe I'll step in. Um, but for the most part, your failures are your own and you get to decide what those look like. Failing is great, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, failing can be very fun. I do love that there is a failure prompts table, um, which is so cool. So if you if you fail and maybe, you know, it's I want to employ something random or we can't decide, you know, exactly what happens. There is a failure prompts table in the game that give these kind of cool, like vague answers like something breaks is like something you can roll on the table. So that could mean maybe the weapon, maybe, you know, your arm, maybe a tree branch above your head. Like there's a lot of cool open for interpretation stuff. Um, so failing is very fun. Um, there's also a game. cool thing that says, uh, and I think this is sort of interesting and really freezes up even more, that the consequence of a failed skill roll does not need to be directly related to the skill roll. Yeah. For instance, if a player character fails a performance skill to blah, 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 maybe they get attacked by an assassin. That feels like a mm -hmm. new choice, but um, which I think is, is <laughs> cool because yeah. it's... You know, uh, you don't have it's to fun just to say look silly all the time, yeah. right? Exactly. I, there's That's a lot exactly of the games that make you it. feel like you whiff a lot, and yeah. I think there's uh -huh. op opportunities to diversify that. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's yes. exactly it. Please. Yeah, so, yeah, if you fail to hack this terminal, maybe a guard comes in, like, just when you're in the middle of, like, sitting at the keyboard or something like that. So we can get really creative uh, with our failures. Um. Yeah. Oh, yes. The failure prompts table. Something breaks. Something is destroyed. You get hurt. You hurt an ally. Enemies arrive. You stumble. You lose something. You get stuck. I just, yeah, I think these are so Yeah. Fun. You cause a scene. <laughs> oh, we're back to that glean again. Oh, man. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, and another mechanic that we will get to, um, it's something called Nova Points. Um, so all of you are going to get abilities that you'll pick in a moment here. Uh, they're called Nova abilities, um, and usually they require Nova points to activate. And the way you get Nova points is um, every time you use a skill with a different dice, uh, you get to check off that off. And once you've used all different types of dice, then you get a Nova point. So that encourages you to use your D12 skills, which are your best, but also your D8s, you know, your, your D4s. Um, so it's trying to encourage you to use the whole breadth and width of your skills, um, because once you do all four, then you get a Nova point. Um, and those points can do very, very cool things. So how are we all feeling about, about these? Feeling like we got a handle? I think so. Just to be clear, as we're choosing them, so mm -hmm. we the the any row there, we have to assign six skills with a D6 or what have you. Yes. And all of that, right? And then there's a couple, well, at least for me, and I assume this is the case for all of us, there's a few that are specifically like, I have a D, one of my physical skills is a D10. Yeah. One of my social, okay, great. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, as dictated by your species. Um, uh there's the little plus one, and I don't I don't recall what that refers to. What's that like telling us? Actually, Is that upgrading a die? Oh, plus one remaining for any category. Oh, okay. Um, so you get like this oh, one plus one any category. Four. So that's it's pretty much something I think from your culture. A lot of those give like you get to choose one skill upgrade or or something like that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so that's sort of a look at skills. How we all feeling? We feeling good about that? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's go ahead and start talking then about our abilities. Warning: Not all skill. Yes. Thank you, roll twenty. Oh, for am I gonna get back. that? Because I have not also done mine. Am I about to get a warning? Yep. You can. I believe you can always go back and edit these, so you can put them yeah. in later. You can. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> So no worries. Um, all right. And then we get to the abilities page. Um, so like I said, again, you get to pick uh, just a double confirm. 
Okay, you get to pick two Nova abilities, uh, and then you get to pick one species special ability. So on your species page, they listed out all of those abilities there. Um, you start with a couple automatically, um, but you also have to choose from that list uh, which ones you would like. <laughs> Sorry, my partner's playing D&D in the room over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's yelling. Uh, it's a big nerdy night here at this house. Um, Sorry, you said we're picking two right now? So you get to pick two Nova abilities. Um, let me see. Are those on here? Do, do, do. And this shouldn't show the ones that we may get for free based on our right. species. Or, okay, right. Yeah. Let's see. Species, special abilities. All right. Let me go back and look and see if I can find the... Uh, do, do, do. Uh, so these two tables here on your species page, um, there's the Drifling special ability. So you get to pick one on here, um, and then you get to pick two from the Nova abilities list. Um, and those are in addition to anything that you automatically get uh, from your species. So one special ability, two Nova abilities. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Uh, in addition to whatever else you might get. Um, yeah, and so, like, these are always um, sort of to represent, I mean, like, you know, the Drifling has these, like, powers to change and morph, um, but these really represent that the these species are all very diverse. Um, there's a lot of diversity even inside from, from member to member of a species. So, you know, some Drifflings are hardier than others. Some are better at shape changing. Um, these things really represent what, what kind of... Um, of adaptations you have specifically as a member of your species. So, yeah. Well, some of these are super fun. <laughs> what are you like? What are your favorites? What are your contenders um, right now? <laughs> well, I think my, my special ability mm -hmm. is gonna be something called Brain Bond, mm. which allows me to use my corpse's dice sizes for mental skills Whoa. rather than my own. Oh my gosh. Um, and there's also a Nova ability. I just really think it's super cool to uh, that not only am I using these corpses for their bodies, but also for their brains? Yes. There's also a Nova ability that I might take called, oh, I lost it, search memories, where I can search a corpse's memories specifically. Oh, so cool. Oh my gosh. So, um, so I think those are, I think those are super cool. <laughs> There's also a funny one just called reusing old parts where I can regain corpse health levels by destroying a different corpse and presumably like integrating it into mine. <laughs> so, I'm definitely taking Radiant Friendliness, yes. wow. which is so cute. Oh my gosh. Uh, your mere presence on the spaceship makes the long trips more friendly and enjoyable. Increase the livability rating of your ship by one. So I'm a good bug to have around, yeah. dang it. Yeah, you are. Yeah, and a quick note for those wondering what livability is. Um, basically, when we get to your ship, um, there are two main stats. Um, there is the MI, so your magic intelligence uh, health level, which is sort of the general health level of the ship. Um, so higher numbers is how much damage your ship can take. Um, and then livability is represents how nice it is to be and to live on your ship. Um, and that number actually dictates how many advantages you all can have as a party. So this is something we'll get into when we get to combat. Um, but basically, you can use actions to set yourself up for advantageous things. Um, and you can create an advantage that goes into a pool that anyone in your party can use. Um, and this is just something during combat um, that can happen. So if your ship livability is three, you can have up to three advantages generated um, that, that exist as a pool for people to draw from. So... Yeah, and some special abilities require that you spend an advantage. Um, otherwise, you can just use advantages to reroll dice. Um, so they're pretty good to have. Livability is is a nice, nice little buff. Also, I imagine the higher your livability is, like the more cool stuff you have in your chip, like a foosball table, or you know, a vending machine. <laughs> a lot of plants. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of little house everywhere. plants. Yeah, they're so nice. The, one, the ones that hang all nice in macrames. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we know there's a voice into it. So, <laughs> green man. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking some Nova abilities that are also pretty support character type. Yay! So, uh, work together. I can spend a Nova point to generate one advantage per ally that I can see, which is, should be Whoa, helpful for a awesome. tough situation. Yeah. 
And then um, I can spend a Nova point to have a vision of the future because the Cthulhu have like real cool, strange religion magic stuff. Yeah, uh, they, and yeah, they worship three goddesses uh, of the past, the present, and the future. Which for those, if you have Venture Maidens fans out there, weird connection, right? Um, but <laughs> yeah, very cool. The Cthic, I, I think they had in their history, they actually foresaw the burn coming and knew about it before a bunch of other species even knew what was going to happen. Boy. I'm loving this ball of death nova ability what tell me about this <laughs> oh no please. you basically condense into a tight ball and can immediately move 10 squares through occupied spaces and deal damage to each of the Whoa. creatures in those spaces if i succeed how terrifying would that be to see i know coming at you <laughs> oh gosh i like it it's awesome <laughs> so good uh, I like it too because my Nova ability is Nova Adoption, so use the Nova abilities of other player characters. <laughs> so that's awesome. Good job picking so, oh, pick it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is good to know. Yes, everything you pick is a catalog for for a friend. True. All right, sweet. Any other any other uh, cool things that are jumping out for y'all? Feeling like you got it locked in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Very cool. All right. So the last part um, of the character creation is buying equipment. Um, you know, getting going shopping, the most important thing. Um, so uh, for equipment, there are a lot of different kind of charts and tables in here um, about what you can buy. But how much money you have, which is called Argent in this, uh, this world. So a little bit about money. Money... Argent is actually like a little organism um, that basically people keep tanks of Argent like around and over time the Argent breeds and actually creates more um, of itself. So on your ship you will have something called an Argent tank which basically works like a, um, a savings account where you can seal Argent in there and it actually like gets interest over time. Oh. So if you put <laughs> it's... Um, it's every 100 days, whatever you have in there increases by 10%. So if you put 100 Argent in your tank, uh, in 100 days, you will have 110 Argent. Um, so some people just, like, have these giant tanks of Argent, uh, and then that's that's how they trade and buy things. So, um, so your culture uh, determines how much, I believe it was your culture, that how much uh, Argent you yeah. start with. Yeah, the wealth of our culture. Yeah. Uh, so do you all have that that number uh, for stuff in front mm -hmm. of you? Okay. Um, so a lot of this stuff on here, um, you have a few basic types. There's your armor stuff. There's weapons. Um, there's vehicles. Um, I would probably recommend skipping vehicles <laughs> for this. Um, there's also stuff like, like cameras or like hobby equipment, you know, if you want to be a Vinter, um, you know, if, if anything is important to your story path, um, you might want to consider some options here. Uh, otherwise picking up a weapon is a pretty good idea. Um, in combat, if you're just using unarmed, um, just base as it is, it's always assumed you do just one damage. Um, the only way to increase that is with items or special abilities, so... Never a bad idea to get, you know, a laser pistol or a laser sword. Uh, they have laser swords, which is... Um, Very tempting. Yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And some of these, too, are consumables. So, you know, we have things like grenades or other stuff you can, you can throw. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of cool stuff on here. Um, Where do we find the descriptions of them? The little eye next to some of these items the page yeah. does not pop uh, up okay um so probably not going to be available in here but i am guessing if you go back up to the right and go to your uh compendium and then hit okay. equipment yes oh yeah acoustic strings there we go all right let me adjust this on the overlay so people can actually see what's happening <laughs> i made my box too big sorry Sorry, everyone. Oh, 
and now it's so small. I'm not wearing what? glasses. Yeah. Face changing disguise badge. So first I inhabit someone else's body, and then I change their face. It's too expensive. I'm not it's buying too- it. But- <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, do keep in mind that um, when you have your ship, you can, if you would like, pool money together to buy upgrades for your ship. Um, so there are things that are called modules. So we're going to be starting with with a basic ship, which comes equipped with like a few weapons and, you know, an, it assumes enough space for you all to live and like function comfortably. Um, but you can buy modules, which do all kinds of stuff. Everything from like med bays to like entertainment centers to uh, just all kinds of stuff uh, that can can affect your characters. So if you do want to hold on to some money, some of those are pretty expensive. Um, we can also just go ahead and you know make our ships and maybe revisit. Um, Ooh, we would work revisit for me. if we would want yeah. to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I'll leave you all to do some some private shopping, window shopping, you know, whatever. Um, okay. You're about to navigate away. Any leftover argent will be sent to the group chat. Oh no! All right, you all are gonna get my oh. money. So I can't do that, but um, that's fine because that basically this game assumes that you all pool your money together because you literally have an Argent tank on your ship mm-hmm. where you store your money to keep it alive because money is alive, which is we love it. It's so good. Yes, um, I love that people just give each other canisters of this substance to pay for things. It's so cool. Everything about this game is cool. I hope everybody in chat, you think it's cool too. Um, yes, very good. Um, okay, so for now, let me go ahead and switch over to our ship screen. We have the ship. I'm sorry. I just saw in the equipment list before we go on, I just saw that one of the items we can buy for 200 Argent is a tabletop role-playing game. <laughs> Let's play this game inside the In this game. game. Oh, God. <laughs> God. Also, a... don't know if y'all saw, but there's something called vampire knuckles. <laughs> oh yes, they, I think it's they similar to like life. brass knuckles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you hit someone with it, and it steals their life. So definitely got me some vampire Whoa. knuckles. Uh, yes. Uh... Yes. So. I think before we talk about our ship, because we are going to, you know, we we have to come up with a name for a magic intelligence. Um, We also have to consider that ships are pretty hard um, to come by. Uh, There are regulations put out on how many new ships can be built um, at any time because these magic intelligences, um, nobody is really sure where they come from basically a ritual spell is cast and then a ship can be imbued with this magic intelligence um and in the past they've tried to do this and like in these big phases where they're just creating a ton of ships and whatever one day this ritual stopped and all of a sudden magic intelligences weren't available anymore and everybody's freaking out wondering what was going on what was happening and then a couple weeks later suddenly more were available and started coming on board the ships, which raised a lot of philosophical questions about like, oh, are we like abducting life forms from other societies or other places or other universes and pulling them to fuel our ships? Like, is that what's happening? Are we taking a resource from somewhere else? We don't really understand what's happening. Um, So to keep that specifically from happening, uh, there are general bans in place on, you know, you can't just make a ton of ships. You have to permit and apply and, and get these things. So magic intelligence, like artificial intelligence, is sort of a taboo subject but also like it's the only resource right now that can propel ships because magic itself is so scarce um so it's hard to come by a ship with a uh, with a you know mi uh so we all have to think about how we got this ship uh, maybe whose ship it was um if some of you bought it together did you buy a secondhand ship like was it commissioned was did you inherit this ship um kind of want to turn it over to you maybe to talk a little bit about these characters we've created um where you think they are and kind of their their paths and motivations and then we can start finding some connections so uh jess why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about your character as they're they're shaping up now um so lou is what i've named her uh 
because Driftlings named themselves after a piece of art they like. So I named her after my real life favorite poem, Do in the Louvre. Uh, um, yeah, she's a, a Driftling from Sela. I feel like, uh, uh, what like what specific things do you want us to explain about our characters right now? I think maybe let's talk about why you're adventuring. Let's start with okay. that. Um, I feel like with Lou, similar to other Driftlings, she just like wants to see everything she can. Um, is just interested in like what else is out there before it is all consumed by the burn. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and then Eugenio, why don't you tell us a little bit about your character? Yeah. Uh, so Atash Telenast uh, is my is my Zavoy. Uh, and they, I think they're a little maybe, maybe jaded, maybe just like feeling a little hopeless. They grew up uh, in this system in the center of the galaxy and spent their whole life and so did their parents uh, sort of trying to regain that fabled like rural agricultural environmental life that used to exist here in this system. And it just, you know, between all of the, the what are they called? The overguilds mm -hmm. uh, and all of the politics and all of the other uh, sapient peoples coming in, uh, they just feel kind of hopeless about the whole thing. And so I think they're adventuring because you know, maybe rather than starting in the middle and working out, maybe we have to work from the outside in mm -hmm. and protect and and take care of those who are most immediately in danger. And then as that stabilizes, uh, we can find some hope for the for the inner worlds. Yeah. And Darcy, tell us about tell us about your your boy. Aunt boy. My boy. My my old man. Old man. He's good. Sweet boy. Uh Ola uh Zazcott. Um, his names are awesome, y'all. So, so good. I, yeah, the, I love that they have some recommended names for all the species. Yes. It helps a lot. Yes. Um, so I think that uh, my deal is that I had a, a long, rambunctious youth as mm -hmm. uh, growing up in Sela, but growing up um, in a in a like really tight knit Kithuk like pod, right, or little yeah. like area. And so even though there was this wild diversity around me. I was really spending a lot of my time with like my little group. Um, and I think, you know, even, even in Sela, right? Like war starts to take, you know, war and economic hardship and the burn takes its toll even in relatively, you know, you know, not on the edge planets like, uh, or areas like Sela. So I think that, you know, there are some wake up call moments and I think, uh, Ola has seen a lot of good people go and uh, is sort of in this very protective phase of his life. And uh, yeah, he's going to be investigating some mysteries. And I think although he's still like a very capable warrior, used to be kind of sort of mercenary kind of type, um, he wants to spend a lot more time sort of using that to protect rather than sort of uh, get sent on, you know, jobs like he did it long ago. So and he wants to be among uh, other species. Oh. That's a great way to better understand the, the people around us. Absolutely. Like cats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our resident Eno. Um, yes. <laughs> and Nassim. Well, given that the Rornans have been scattered throughout the galaxy, I believe, well, first of all, I've named my character after our home planet. Uh, Vama, yeah. and we are now going to be the Vam Fam. That's the name. Love this. Love it. Love uh, all of this. <laughs> Thank you. We are determined to find, seek out our uh, other family uh, horde members throughout the galaxy. We have some weak connections with a few other hordes that we've known. Uh, I am from, my culture is from Sela, I believe mm -hmm. it is pronounced so i um, my goal is to gain followers and uh basically rebuild a society on one of the deserted planets in the galaxy uh bring the horde together and anyone else who wants to be a part of it as well so i'm i'm basically determined to rebuild my planet yeah very and, cool yeah 
Um, and of the four of you, who do you think would have this ship or have gotten you the connection to this ship? Because um, ships are, we could do, you know, it could be like a, a secondhand ship that, you know, it's, yeah, it's holding together. It, it works, but it ain't comfortable. Um, or this could be a, a relatively new ship that you've bought. Or, I mean, since many of you are from Sela, is all of you are from Sela except... Except, Not. yeah, except uh, Atash. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of money flying around Sulla. Um, so potentially maybe you won this ship uh, in in a gambling match or, you know, you oh. you worked, you did a job for the Overguilds that paid really well and you managed to get a ship. Um, or up to you. Who, who, who do you think among you might have uh, accrued this vessel? I feel like it kind of makes sense since the three of us are from Sala that at some point it almost like they're like groups among Sala like on Sala that are just sort of like all right who's ready to get the heck out of here here's yeah. where you find your new group partner did you post a flyer in like your community college and be yeah. like hey LFG um, <laughs> hey I gotta get the heck out of here who's with me let's pull our resources let's let's buy a secondhand ship and let's get the heck out so who do you think started that, Louv? Is that something you feel like Louv would have would have done, or uh... definitely, yeah. yeah, awesome. Okay, so you posted, yeah. How did you uh, how did you put the word out? How did, or I guess maybe, um, how did I see? I'm still learning names. Um, Darcy and Nassim, how did uh, your characters find this or or find this out? Yeah, interesting. Um, I think Ola uh, has been like, you know has been on the lookout for like a, a way to get off planet. I think something bad had recently happened. And so I think Ola, you know, the scene is Ola looking, looking through a marketplace and co literally coming across one of your flyers, uh, one of your beautifully crafted uh, flyers. <laughs> um, yeah. I think we maybe get caught up in this. I mean, like, do you post about like what you're interested in doing? Is it just like get off planet or is it about, seek adventure what, what's what's the pitch I, yeah i feel like the entire flyer very generous of you to say like beautifully put together um because <laughs> i feel like it probably looks like hastily cobbled together out of like many different like even it's she probably like saw other people's flyers and was like this makes a lot of sense and grabbed the little like ticks you can grab off of the bottom of other people's flyers mm. and used those yeah. to create her own flyer wow <laughs> so it really like stands a, out like a ransom note with like the little <laughs> magazine cut out oh, yes a murder <laughs> letter good that's <laughs> like i'm getting out of here <laughs> with me <laughs> yes oh gosh i probably heard from just the horde mind the horde network just saw that someone is offering a chance off the planet and i've done good work here but uh, we're looking for new recruits in a less populated area. Yeah. Um, and then, Lou, uh, where would you have, like, had this meeting or, like, hosted people? Where do you meet somewhere public? Do you do you have a place you lived, uh, an apartment, um, a, a job? Or, you know, where where would you call people to to meet with, with you? Um. Probably she would have had people meet her at like a cafe or like an arcade of some sort, somewhere pretty public, but also somewhere where she could like be doing something else in case nobody showed up. So she could sort of be like, no, I was here for this other thing. <laughs> Don't oh, yes. worry about it. I love her. <laughs> yeah. So relatable. <laughs> very, very cool. Um, yeah. And then uh, for Eugenio, how do you think you, you got involved in this? Um, or, or, or all of you tell me, maybe you all had an adventure beforehand and then ended up going to, to where Eugenio's character was. Um, do we like that idea? Maybe we can explore that. No? Yeah, I'd what, be curious what yeah. brought you all to, uh, to the Dried system. Um, yeah, what, can... what did bring you all? Um, maybe it was like the first job you ever ended up doing. Um, it took you to the Dried system. Why don't you all tell me? little bit about that um jess what who did you get the mission from uh probably a fellow driftling who understood lose the need to just like get out and was like all right i can i can help you out a little bit he like get a crew together and 
I can set something up for you. Cool. So sort of like a, a mentor who's like, I get it. Like, let's let's get you out of here. Um, yeah. And then uh, Darcy, tell me what what did you have to do with this job? Were you delivering something? Did you have to pick something up? You um, know, uh, I I'm I'm open to what originally sent us there, but there's a bit of uh, stuff in the book about um, there's sort of an ongoing like kind of war going on with Kathuk and like uh, the, the Republic there and, um, you know, sort of agriculturists versus uh, more like war or mongering folk. And so um, maybe we get called in to like drop off a package, but I wonder if the, the, the job suddenly becomes more complicated. And I wonder if we get sort of dragged into some conflict. Ooh, definitely. Um, why don't you, uh, Eugenio, tell me about a conflict oh. that was happening in your area um, that kind of dragged in this this ship that was supposed to deliver something? Uh, what was going on in your community? Yeah, there was. So you know, the sort of the the as without, so within, right? So within the system, uh, and I just can't remember the name of the system. Within the Drite system, system. Yeah. it's the, it's bright, but with a D. I don't know why it's yes. so hard for me. Uh, <laughs> In the Drite Burn system, that's fine. Uh, the Dern Drite, uh, there is sort of a centralized right, like uh, uh, in the center, in the in the planet at the center of the system, right, the central planet. Um, there is sort of this consolidation of power, uh, and then there are all these sort of rural uh, leftover agricultural blah blah blah. And I think this, uh, I think this delivery was probably to uh, try and help a group of of us who were out in sort of these more rural areas that are still left, uh, trying to keep a um, keep a sort of. I don't want to say isolationist, but like keep the keep the change out, right? Keep yeah. keep our way of life as it is. Uh, and I I don't know if this delivery was to help us or to help mm. them. Oh yeah. Uh, but in either case, uh, you know, if it was to help us, then I think I very much attached to these three very exciting adventures uh, because though they may have been able to bring us those supplies, I think I knew. And many of us knew that, like, it just delayed the inevitable for us. So that's where I sort of, that was sort of the, the final straw that broke my sluggy back. Uh, <laughs> that that I just want to get out and try this somewhere else. And what three exciting people have just turned up for me uh, to give me a chance to do that. And because a ship. Because obviously if they, yeah. and, and a and ship, a ship also a helpful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. And so you got you got rounded up with this bunch. Um, and then so just to, to fast forward a little bit, um, our module begins with basically you all have like successfully completed a job um, and you are currently relaxing. Well, let me get this right. <laughs> Shall I? <laughs> One second. Processing. Um, but basically, uh, you are relaxing at the end of an adventure that you have successfully completed, a job that set you up with a little bit of money, enough that you could take a break. Um, so, Nassim, why don't you tell me, what was that last job that you did? It, it went great, and you got paid well. Um, so what kind of job was it? Pro prob well, as a crew or individually? As a crew, yeah. What was what was your your whole first mission together? as a foursome um what was it and it, it ended well so can you tell me a little bit about it uh if we were delivering supplies uh, i think uh in addition to that we were i i at least wanted to give technical aid to the people on this system and help mm -hmm. them rebuild their communications center and their hub to have everyone across the planet be able to connect and obviously uh, organize and regroup after whatever attacks or whatever uh conflict is happening sure. on their planet yeah so i think maybe after you know you successfully delivered these supplies um you know and, and linked up with eugenio's character um you were approached by somebody from an organization known as the alliance of relief and conservation uh, otherwise known as the arc they're sort of a conglomerate of do-gooders around the galaxy they're pretty disorganized though um they don't really have a centralized force, but they do have a lot of agents out there in the world who do identify as being part of the ARC and want the same things to help people. Um, but the way they go about it is a little scattered and mishmashed. But maybe one of these people, maybe it was a peacecraft 
who works for them, um, approached you, saw your good work, and then asked you to run to certain locations and repair some comm stations. Um, and for that, they were able to give you some funds. Um, so you were able to get off that planet. You got a nice payday. Uh, you're all getting to know each other. You successfully completed these these couple jobs. Um, and you're going to go and uh, spend some time relaxing. Um on a very awesome casino planet that I can't find the name of. Uh, what that's could okay. possibly go wrong? We'll get to it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think that's a uh, that's about where we are. We've only got about ten minutes though, so we've got to make some ship de- decisions very quickly. Um, so let's do it. So starting things off, um, we have three different types of ships that you all can choose from. Um, each of these ships have. Uh, you know the the magic score mi score which is sort of the health of the ship again and then the livability score um so let me pull these up here um oh i'm just looking at guitar strings all over the place okay ship module oh i probably shouldn't show you that okay so the the three types we can choose from are the bolt the predator and the wanderer um, so the bolt, this guy here, you can see on the screen. Um, so they're sleek rockets made for moving through outer space in style, uh, developed by the Kithux, uh, for travel across, uh, long distances for comfort. Um, but they, all of these ships do start with the same weapons, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but it has, uh, hit points of three, so your magic, uh, MI score of three, uh, and then it also has a livability rating of three. Um, so that's kind of your even option uh, and then we have the predator which is a ship specifically built for war uh, made by the Ulrens. Um this has an cool. mi rating of five um but a livability rating of one so it's it's very bare bones in there but very strong if you plan to do a lot of fighting uh, and then our third option we have the wanderer um, so the Wanderers, uh, made by the Gleans, um, made primarily to transport cargo. Um, so these have a MI rating of four and then a livabil- livability of two. So they're a little chonkier, but they are meant primarily to transport cargo, um, and industrial stuff. So what's it going to be? We want a really comfy ship. We want a really safe ship. What do you want? What do you want? Well, but I'll make it comfier no matter what. So that's true. Be Just by being there, my ship is better. <laughs> it's so cute. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Just based on the kind of missions that we've already talked about that you all went on before you met me and then the one that we did together, it doesn't feel like a Predator is our ship. Yeah. It feels like probably so. either a Bolt or a Wanderer. I will say I'm a little more drawn to the Bolt, but the missions that we've talked about sort of feel more Wanderer. So I don't know. What do we think? I feel like Wanderer makes sense for what we just like what we came up with as sort of the backstory of like we basically got like a secondhand ship just because we were like let's get out of here and and explore. Yeah, it's a little ragtag, which is fun. Yeah, like not necessarily yeah. the best for like having a bunch of people on board, <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> you'll it's put good up some, enough. Fine. You'll put up That's some right. posters and it'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are no windows. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> it's like your college apartment. Um, <laughs> all right. Cool. So we have a wanderer. Um, so yeah. now we have to decide about our magic intelligence. So this is a personality who runs the ship, is capable of you know steering it, does all the basic functions, basically, so you all don't have to constantly be manning the ship. Um, this can talk to you. You can interface with this in sort of a cyberspace. Do we have any thoughts about what our wanderer, what our secondhand wanderer kind of personality might be? What what have we gotten on this ship? And then we have to come up with a name for them as well. Oh no. Mm-hmm. They're like a little snarky, right? A yeah. Little snarky, a little sassy. Uh, a, little, yeah. a little over it maybe. A little like world weary. Yeah. Yeah, like maybe maybe they thought they were done. To and old then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we're greenhorns, at least when it comes to like fl- flying our own ship. We really don't, you know, we haven't been together very long, so yeah, it's sort of more experienced than we are, and is a little mad about it. I love it. 
I love it. Um, probably also a little bitter that <laughs> it got sold. It's less crew. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Loving uh-huh. this. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, do we have any thoughts about name <laughs> for this intelligence? There are, wait, let's just have a ch- quick look at chat because there are some <gasps> suggestions. Let's Whoa. Um, do it. So we have suggestions that I have seen so far Siri, <laughs> Heron, Lou, no. Lou, Lou Data, <laughs> Whoa. Gertrude. I love Gertrude. These are a lot of, <laughs> these are a lot of, uh, a lot of just human names uh, Mildred and Patrice. Wow, I love that. Uh, okay, Gert- we also have Sleek Justice, which is like on the cool. other side of the spectrum. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. So whenever I can't think of a name, uh, mm-hmm. my cheat is to like pick a title, like mm-hmm. the something, right? Like, so I've been like the Cicatrix, which is like the wound or the Haft is like one of my Skyrim characters, mm-hmm. right? Like um, mm-hmm. an object that kind of like, you know, uh, works as a title and is thematically interesting so that's my cheat i don't have any ideas i'm just gonna lob it out there mm-hmm. <laughs> i'm seeing a lot of names that have chonk in it in the suggestion uh-huh it's been i'm putting some ship. in the chat now because like, yeah at chonk tortoise. yellington <laughs> look at this I also really boy. like I, like, I'm always, whenever I can't think of a name, I try to like spin off the name that it, or it like it's, it's origins or something like that. Hello, Vam Fam. Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> since it's the Wanderer, I like Wanda kind of. <gasps> yes, oh, Wanda's so oh. good. Wanda can be so sassy. Wanda. God, yeah. I feel okay. it. Wanda, I, I think we've I done Wanda. it. Wanda. I think we've done it, Wanda. I, there's, y'all, thank you, chat, because y'all <laughs> are. Are... Matt Chunk Yellington is gonna just Chunk live Yellington. in my heart for a the while. Same. We're getting Amazing. approval for Wanda in chat too. That's nice. Um, yes, it. is Chunk Wanda. I also really <laughs> love. Someone suggested Mama's tired, and I love the <laughs> idea that like the ship took us oh a long took a long time to like actually tell us its name. It just kept it like. Just well, so what is your Ma- name? Mama's tired. Mama's tired. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! I just had Wanda would just turn the on. lights off, like go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> my head cannon is that our ship Wanda sounds whenever it speaks to us sounds like Wanda Sykes. Oh my god! Oh my I god! I feel like oh. she would be great at the like. I'm Heck, done with you. Yes, <laughs> that's way better than my head cannon until you said that, which was Wanda from the Fairly Odd Parents. <laughs> oh my god! Also good. Uh, okay. Not as good as yours. <laughs> the two combine. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, we've we've done it. We've made our characters. We've named a ship. I'm going to go back to the main screen right now and we're going to do some outros cuz this has been so fun. But here we go. Whoa. Oh, uh, wow. Thank you everybody so much for sticking around. This was awesome. I am so excited to play more with all of your characters and Wanda, who I think is just going to be a delight. Um, to be quite honest. So <laughs> before we uh, close out, I want to make sure we go around one more time and, you know, remind folks who you are and where they can find you. Uh, so Darcy, where can folks go to find you? Well, when I'm not in Wanda, you can find me uh, doing Monty Cook Games things at uh, montycookgames.com or at, you know, Twitter, Monty Cook Games, Instagram, etc. And you can see my feed full of weird RPG stuffs, weird critters, biology nonsense, the occasional snail or slug, I will warn you, uh, at Darcy L. Ross. Uh, yeah. Uh, awesome. And Nassim, where can folks go to find you? Find me everywhere online at Nazgul and uh, Wednesday nights on the Venture Maidens Twitch channel. Woo! Uh, and Jess. Uh, you can find me at Right Jess R um, and on uh, at D20 Games. Yay! And Yehenio, where can folks go to find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at DM Jazzy Hands. You can find The Last Refuge on Twitter at, at DND Last Refuge. Uh, and you can find me on Thursday and Friday afternoons here on Twitch on my channel, twitch.tv slash DM Jazzy Hands, uh, lately doing some Dragon Age streaming. Uh, and my name is Celeste Conowich. You can go and find me on Twitter at C Conowich. Uh, see everything I'm talking about. Yeah, like Nassim said, find me on the Venture Maidens channel. Uh, check out our podcast, our show. Uh, we are going to be back Thursday at this exact same time uh, next week and for nine weeks after that um, as we play through Burning Daylight, a module for Burn Bright. So we are going to be back with this awesome crew actually getting into some story uh, next time which is going to be so, 
so cool. Um, and yeah, this is this is Burn Bright for all of you out there. I hope that this gave you a little bit of a taste of the game uh, and what you have in store. Uh, there's a lot of amazing lore in this game, a lot to uncover that we will find out more and more. I'm so excited to show off these mechanics for you. Again, uh, Burn Bright is the first tabletop role-playing game specifically designed for Roll20. Um, so we are going to be showcasing, We it was mostly just you know information on the screen tonight, but we are really going to be showcasing all the features and tools. Uh, I'm really excited, especially for combat. It has some really cool stuff with the initiative tracker and just a bunch of cool stuff. Um, if you want to find out more about the game or pre-order the game, uh, go to burnbright.com. Check every Everything else. Uh, right now, Burn Bright, the character mancer and character sheets are available. Um, so you can get in there, you can play around, you can see all the cool stuff you can do as a space slug. Um, very awesome. Uh, the game was designed by James and Tricasso, Jim McClure, Cat Cool, and the amazing Darcy Ross. Um, also very cool, this game has a built-in safety deck as part of the game, as part of the interface. So this game is making important strides in safety, and I just really want to point that out. Um, gosh, I think this game is very cool. I'm really excited to be back next time. I hope you all are, too. All right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, I think that's all from us, so be sure to be back here next week. 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. I think that's all. So have a good one, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs>